Okay, welcome back. In this video, we're going to continue our discussion of complement by talking about the other two major pathways of complement activation, the lectin pathway and the alternative complement pathway. So in the last video, we finished uh, talking about the classical pathway, which remember is initiated by the binding of C1, and in particular C1Q, uh, the binding domain of C1 uh, to antibodies or directly to pathogenic surfaces, uh, which initiates the cleavage of C4 and C2 and ultimately forms a C3 convertase. So what are the other ways we can get to a C3 convertase? Well, the other two pathways are known as the lectin pathway. Uh, lectins are molecules that bind sugars. So as we'll see, uh, this is a pathway that's good at recognizing carbohydrate residues on the surfaces of pathogens. And the other pathway, the alternative pathway, um, it's a little bit trickier. We'll go into its details, but um, it can either uh, happen somewhat spontaneously or it can sort of co-opt a C3B that is generated by uh, the lectin or the classical pathways. So let's get into it. We'll start with the lectin pathway. So as I mentioned, lectins are molecules that bind carbohydrates, that bind sugars. Um, and as we said over and over, uh, one of the major roles of the immune system is to recognize non-self entities, recognize molecular patterns that are associated with microbes but which don't appear on the surface of our own cells. As it turns out, the sugars on the surface of bacteria and yeast look different than the sugars on the surface of our cells. So an example that your book gives here are of, of particularly of yeasts. So the biochemistry here is not important, but you can see here that um, the sugars on the surface of these yeast molecules are largely made up of a sugar called mannose, um, whereas the sugars on vertebrate uh, cells, um, mannose does not typically be does not is not typically well represented on the sort of most uh, external residues of these carbohydrate chains. So mannose, as it, therefore, turns out to be a really good target for the complement system. Um, if the complement system can target cells that have a lot of mannose on their surface, um, then they're uh, assured to be targeting uh, microbes and not our own healthy cells. And so how does the complement system bind to carbohydrates that are associated with pathogens? Well, there are two different binding proteins associated with the lectin pathway. Uh, the first is MBL, or mannose binding lectin. You should be able to guess then that this is a lectin that binds mannose, uh, that sugar. And uh, what you can see here is these are, um, these are monomers of MBL, uh, but they have these carbohydrate recognition domains that bind directly to mannose. Um, phycolin is another lectin uh, which does a similar thing. It just recognizes different types of carbohydrates called fibronectin. For, but in the case of both of these, they're going to bind to their target sugars on the surface of cell. And you can notice that they actually form polymers that look a lot like the protein C1. So MBL and phycolin are uh, their homologous structures to C1. They do basically the same thing, but in the lectin pathway instead of the classical pathway. So MBL is going to bind to mannose, phycolin is going to bind to fibronectin um, on the surface of cells. And so uh, like C1, they have these binding domains, but they also have proteolytic domains called MASPs, uh, M-A-S-P's. Uh, the definition here is not all that important, but notice that they are proteases. So these pr the protease domains are important for initiating uh, the next sequence of events. And so basically the lectin pathway looks identical to the, cla to the classical pathway, but instead of binding through C1, they bind through lectins. And when a lectin binds specifically the MASP2 domain of the lectin, either MBL or phycolin, uh, can bind to C4 and uh, cleave it into C4A, which remember from the classical pathway floats away, C4B attaches to the cell. And from here, everything should look familiar from the last video. So C4B attaches to the cell, C4B uh, recruits C2, and uh, C2 is cleaved by C4B into either C2B, which floats away, or C2A. Uh, hopefully at this point you remember that C4B to A is a C3 convertase. Um, so the C3 convertase can recruit C3, cleave it into C3A, which floats away, C3B stays attached. Um, 
and uh, the C3B or the C3 convertase in all of the pathways, an important thing to know about it is that it's actually, it's really efficient. It can really chew through a lot of C3. Um, and so when we form a C3 convertase through any of the pathways, um, a lot of C3 gets cleaved. And so that means a lot of C3B gets stuck to the surface of the cell. A lot of C3A gets released to induce inflammation. Um, and so this is a way that these pathways amplify themselves. It's a feed forward loop basically. Um, and so that's an important way of, of how they function. So, like I said, this is the lectin pathway. The only thing that was different was the very first step. So instead of C1, we had those two lectins, either mannose binding lectin or phycolin. Everything else downstream of that looked the same. Let's talk about the alternative pathway. It's a little bit more complicated, unfortunately, um, but not too bad. So let's just try to walk through it slowly. One of the ways that the alternative pathway functions is actually to sort of co-opt or take advantage of C3B that has already been generated by the other two pathways. So remember when we make a C3 convertase, we make a lot of C3B. That C3B uh, can then be bound by a molecule associated with the alternative pathway called factor B. Factor B binds to uh, specifically to C3B, and uh, C3B stabilizes factor B such that it's able to bind to a second molecule of the alternative pathway called factor D. So as a general rule, the, the, the proteins with numbers are associated with the classical and lectin pathways. These new molecules we're introducing that have letter names like factor letter, or felt like factor X, um, these are associated with the alternative pathway. So factor B is bound to C3B, factor D comes in, and it is a protease which cleaves factor B. And just like with the numbered proteins, when we cleave one of these lettered proteins, it also has a smaller fragment which floats away and a larger fragment which stays behind. In this case, the smaller fragment is capital B, lowercase a, BA, which floats away. And the fragment that stays behind is capital B, lowercase b. So now we started with C3B. We attached it to the subunit of factor B called BB, and so that macromolecular complex is sort of hilariously called C3BBB. Um, I didn't name it, so you know, don't blame me, but um, ultimately C3BBB is the C3 convertase of the alternative pathway. So that's what's really important here is that uh, the, the alternative pathway has its own C3 convertase. Um, which instead of having C4 and 2 uh, has factor B as its complementary uh, domain uh, in conjunction with, with C3B. Um, or, uh, yeah. so, so C3B BB is the C3 convertase, and just like with the C3 convertase of the lectin and the classical pathways, it's also very good at chewing through a lot of C3. So we get a lot of deposition, fixation of C3B onto the cell surface, a lot of release of C3A, and all of the downstream effector things that happen. So this is an example of the alternative pathway getting started. Um, because of C3B deposition that has already happened because of the other two pathways. However, we don't need the other two pathways specific or uh, always to initiate the alternative pathway. The alternative pathway can happen on its own, and in order to happen on its own, it relies on a process under which C3, so uncleaved C3, so A and B are still together, um, C, uncleaved C3 can actually undergo spontaneous hydrolysis. Uh, so it takes on a water molecule, and in this case, the, this hydrolyzed C3 we call C3H2O. It's represented here with uh, this little mark, which I guess represents a water molecule. When C3 hydrolyzes into C3H2O, and again, this is happening spontaneously, nothing you know external is causing this to happen, it can also bind factor B, uh, which can then be degraded by factor D into BB and BA, um, and this forms a molecule called C3H2OBB, written here. So remember that the C3 convertase of the alternative pathway that we saw before was C3BBB. This is C3H2OBB, which is also um, a, a C3 convertase in the alternative pathway. So either of them works. Um, one thing that you may be wondering is why would we spontaneously turn on complement? Um, you know, if there's no pathogen around, what do we need complement for? And isn't that kind of wasteful? Isn't it kind of dangerous even? 
Um, and those are good questions. And, and the answer to that is that C3B actually is really, really unstable. So if, we ma if we're making C3B and there's nothing around for it to attach to, attach to it's rapidly degraded, it's rapidly inactivated. Um, and so um, even though we're constantly making a little bit of C3B because of this spontaneous hydrolysis of C3, um, if there is no infection around, it basically comes to nothing. There, um, and so uh, it, it doesn't really pose a danger to us because our cells have a lot of intrinsic mechanisms that prevent complement from attaching to our cells. Um, that being said, because we always have a little bit of C3B, basically the minute we do have an infection, we have a little pool of complement ready to go to attach to any new bacteria or yeast or whatever that come into our bodies um, and to initiate and, and feed into that feed forward loop uh, to amplify the complement response really, really quickly. So even though this process is a little wasteful energetically, um, it's a, it really important for, for allowing us to have a very fast innate immune response that's ready to go at a moment's notice to fight infection. So the alternative pathway is really important for that reason. Um, so, um, you know, otherwise, you know, the alternative pathway, it gets started in a slightly different way than the lectin and the, and the classical pathways. Um, instead of using C1, C4, and C2, um, it uses factor B and factor D to complex with C3 in order to make a C3 convertase. Um, the um, other thing that I want to note here is that the alternative pathway has an additional factor which really stabilizes this process and, um, and allows it to continue uh, w uh, for a long time, and that is a molecule called factor P. Um, all factor P does is bind to C3B, BB, and stabilizes this interaction. So remember I said C3B is kind of an unstable molecule? Um, you know, it, it hangs around long enough to do what it needs to do, but when factor P is involved, um, its association with BB is really strengthened, um, and in that case, because it stays attached to the cell for longer, it, its C3 convertase activity continues for longer, and it sort of uh, makes sure that the, that the process of, of complement fixation goes on and activates all of those important downstream effector functions that we've mentioned. Okay, so uh, we, we blew right through that, the, the lectin pathway and the alternative complement pathway. So let's summarize all of the, the complement initiation pathways that we discussed in, in this video and the last one. So complement proteins are an ancient, really, really old, really, really conserved antimicrobial defense system. They are able to bind things like uh, sugars on the surface of bacteria and yeast, actually, as we saw, um, as well as pathogens coated with antibodies. Um, however, our cells are protected through various molecular mechanisms. So complement doesn't bind to our cells very well, um, but it's very good at binding to uh, the, 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 cell, the surfaces of cells, either that have been recognized by antibodies or that have other molecular features that, that distinguish them as belonging to pathogens. There are three major pathways by which the complement uh, process gets started. Uh, the lectin pathway is triggered by carbohydrates on pathogenic surfaces. The classical pathway is primarily triggered by antibodies, so remember C1 binds to antibodies. Um, and the alternative pathway can either begin spontaneously or it can sort of amplify the other two pathways by starting at the, at the step of C3B deposition on the cell surface. All three pathways, once again, converge on generation of a C3 convertase. Um, so we've seen over and over that many complement proteins require cleavage to become activated, and usually the protein upstream of them, immediately upstream of them in, in the process, has proteolytic activity, which cleaves them. Um, and so it's just a stepwise cascade. That's why we call it the complement cascade. It's just one proteolytic uh, activation step after another. Um, so the C3 convertase is basically the same in the case of the lectin and the classical pathways, um, and the alternative pathway has a couple of its own uh, C3 convertase complexes, which involve uh, uh, factors B and D. Okay, cleavage of C3 initiates multiple antimicrobial processes, um, inflammation, activation and recruitment of immune cells, uh, phagocytosis, that, or opsonization, remember, um, as well as membrane attack. Um, and so all of these things are important for making sure that uh, complement is able to fight infection. Um, and so in the next video, we're going to go into each of these three effector functions in a lot of detail and really, uh, you know, finally get to why is complement important? What does it actually do to protect our cells from infection? Stay tuned for that.